dare great things for Christ. Christ calls us to dare great things. In the marketplace, as well as in the mission field, there has never been a time like the present for the spirit of the Catholic entrepreneur. Now is the time for men and women of great courage and great vision to engage our church and our culture. Now is the time to dare great things. And here is your host as we dare great things, Father Nathan Cromley, the president and founder of the St. John Institute. What difference is there between a Christian leader and a non-Christian leader? Does being a Christian impact leadership? Understanding the ways that it does is vital for us who are called by Christ to lead in our world today. One place we can look to see what it means to lead as a Christian is the life of the Virgin Mary. In this final segment of our 13-part course on Mary's leadership, we take a deeper look at what it means for her to rule as Queen of Heaven and Earth. Well, everyone, congratulations. You've made it. We're at part 13 of our 13-part course of our, on Our Lady as a leader and looking at leadership through the lens of the life of the Virgin Mary. And I love doing this because, of course, if Jesus is the King of Kings and all leadership can be summed up really in him because he's the perfect man and his humanity was the perfect instrument of God, right, his Godhead, well, then every saint who's a member of his body will reflect back his splendor in a certain way. We call that their charism or, or their special grace, right? St. Francis of Assisi would have really embodied his poverty. St. Catherine of Siena would, would have really shown us Jesus's love for the Father, right? You can look at each of the lives of the saints, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, Jesus's love for the poor. And every saint, we see Jesus a little bit better. Well, Mary is the holiest of them all. Because she was his mother, therefore closest to him and called in a very, in the most intimate of ways as his mother to give herself to him and to serve him every day of his life. And then, of course, she also was the preeminent disciple who obeyed the father's will more perfectly than anyone else. And therefore was most perfectly, as Jesus himself says, his mother and his sister, right, and, and his disciple. And then, of course, at the foot of the cross, she offered her son willingly to the will of the Father, even if that meant, you know, the sufferings of the cross. And so therefore cooperated with him in his will for redemption in a totally unique way. And, and therefore looking at her, we're able to better understand him. And, and everything that we do is to understand Jesus better. And so just like you can look at and understand God's power and majesty by, by looking at the mountains, right? Or you could contemplate the depths of his mercy by, by fathoming the ocean, right? It's in the same way by looking at Mary, you can see the power of his redemption. And you can also see in a, in a beautiful way the instrumentality of a leader. Because Mary was given by Jesus to John in order to be John's mother. In other words, she was tasked when Jesus gave her to John with a task of leadership. I want you to lead like a mother leads her son, this disciple deeper into knowledge of me. Right? So Mary had in a very direct way to mother John. And that means to assert herself as an instrument of God so that God could use her, her genius, her talents, her personality, everything that she had in order to influence and impact John for his greater glory. And of course, when he did that, we, we, you know, Christians have always believed that Jesus was entrusting every disciple to her so that Mary could exercise this influence over those disciples. And so whenever you exercise influence, that's an act of leadership. I mean, Mary was not allowed to just be passive, to say, I'm just a daughter of the church. I have nothing to do. I just pray all day to God, but my life is inconsequential. No, she was given another mission by Jesus at the cross. And that mission was to mother John. And so in her motherhood, as she gives herself, well, she, you know, th there's, there's an interaction there. We see it immediately present at Pentecost when all the disciples are gathered with Mary in the upper room for nine days of prayer, and she's teaching the church how to pray. Well, again, that's a form of leadership. 
to deny that Mary is a leader, right, is, is to deny that teachers are leaders, is to deny that mothers are leaders, is to deny that, that disciples, right, are, are called to lead. And there are some people that I think that do that, that just subconsciously put religion as an emotional thing that somehow or other makes them feel good and that there, therein lies its value. But its value is much greater than that. Religion is supposed to be the body of Christ sent into the world to further the mission of Christ. And therefore, we need to have the active role that, like Mary, of, of actually mothering this broken world. And bringing this world back to God with all of the, the fire that's in the heart of, of a mother, right? So isn't this why we call it Holy Mother Church, right? Because that's exactly what we're supposed to be. I think we're just way too passive and we think way too little of ourselves, which is why the St. John Leadership Network, we're trying to wake you up. We're trying to say there's something greater for you to achieve that God wants you to achieve with your life. If even the Virgin Mary who socially had no power whatsoever, right, could become the instrument by which God would send his Savior into the world. What could he do with you? Imagine that. And the positions and, and, and the influence and the resources, you know, that you marshal. I think he wants to do great things with each one of us. The question is whether or not we're going to dare to follow. Well, in 1954, October 11th, Pope Pius XII it wrote a beautiful letter called Ad Celi Regina, right? Meaning to the Queen of Heaven. And, and he, it's, a, it's a letter that he wrote, and I think about 1954, that's just nine years after the end of World War II. And the Cold War was beginning to build up, and people were full of anxiety. The Pope actually makes reference to that, saying that the following upon the frightful calamities, which before our very eyes have reduced flourishing cities, towns, and villages to ruin, we see to our sorrow that many great moral evils are being spread abroad in what might be described as a violent flood. Right? Occasionally we behold justice giving way and on the one hand or the other the victories of the powers of corruption. The threat of this fearful crisis fills us with great anguish and so with confidence we have recourse to Mary, our Queen. And he goes on in this letter to institute the feast of the Queenship of Mary. And this is celebrated every year on August 22nd uh, and throughout the church, right? And so in 1954, the Pope felt the need to institute this feast day in order to encourage Christians throughout the world to turn to Mary, to turn to the Queen of Heaven with their anxieties and their fears about the future. Now, of course, I think this is really poignant because we continue today to, f to suffer from great anxiety and worries. And wouldn't we want to do the same? The Pope turns us and says, invoke our lady and invoke her power as queen of heaven and earth. Now, right when we say that, of course, that fits right into what we're trying to do here, right? You're saying, well, if we invoke her, that means that she has been given some sort of power from God. Exactly. And that she's going to assert that power from God for our benefit. Exactly. And therein, my friends, we have the model for what every single one of you is supposed to be doing. I mean, if he's given you a dental office or if he's given you a physician's practice or if he's given you a role as a manager in a company, it's not just to make good products and to make them well and to do good things with your wealth. Of course, th that is probably a big part of it, those three things. But it's more than that. It's to do them as an instrument of God. To look upon what you do every day as a mission given to you by God and therefore, something you've got to step up to do in order to give of the blessing that God wants to give to this world through your efforts. You are, in other words, members of the body of Christ who are engaging in our world, in the fields of politics and social transformation and are raising your voices against injustice everywhere that it is. And all those things, we, we do this as an instrument of God. And that's what makes us so powerful. Well, it's the same for Mary. What I want to do is look with you now at how she actually do does this, the way that she exercises her prerogative that was given to her by Christ of exercising influence over the world because it's so beautiful. The Pope says it beautifully in paragraph 43, let all Christians therefore glory in being subjects of the Virgin Mother of God who, while wielding royal power, is on fire with a mother's love. How wonderful is that? Our queen is our mother.
Would you like to hear more from Father Nathan? Join the St. John Leadership Network and receive a two-minute glance at the gospel every Sunday morning right to your phone. To learn more, go to www.stjohnleadershipnetwork.org slash member and join for free today. So obviously the life of the Virgin Mary is an extraordinary example of Christian discipleship, right? Uh, she gives everything she has in the service of Christ, right? To be his mother. Then she gives it again in the, in the presentation of the temple when she surrenders him, consecrates him over to God. And then she gives everything that she has again when she allows her son to go out in his apostolic, you know, mission, actually sending him on his way there at Cana. And then finally at the cross where once again, she gives everything that she has in the service of God. And this is where we meet Mary, right? Because it's not, it's not, we don't have a similitude of life with her, but we do have a similitude of situation, meaning that there is a world that needs to be saved and there's a God that's calling upon us to surrender what we have into his service so that he can then save it. And so we do that in a million different ways, very humble ways, very ordinary ways are just fine. That's actually the most important of ways. I think, of course, the leadership in the home. This is the most important place for us to lead. And yet it's the most hidden from society. But it doesn't really matter. It's still the most important. And it's where God works his miracles. And yet at the same time, of course, there's also the roles that we play in leading our culture and our society today. And then all of this, though, that what's the role? The role that we play is that of an instrument. And that's where Mary really demonstrates for us what it means to be used by Christ, to be incorporated into Christ as a member of his body in such a way that he can extend his influence through us into the world, right? So the very first thing that she demonstrates to us in this is her absolute humility. And this is, of course, something I go over again and again with my business leaders, that the, that the virtue of humility is the most explosive of all the virtues because it enables you to live all of the rest of them, right? So if you have humility, you get out of the way for the great things that God wants to do through you. You become so focused on him that everything that we do becomes an instrument for his glory. It becomes an occasion for him to be made known. Oh, it, our love for God increases to the degree that our humility increases, right? It, because the more humble that we are, well, the more that our, our love becomes everything. And we become like Mother Teresa would say, a pencil in the hand of God. That everything that we do is free from respect to the world and the fears of this world because we do everything that we do as God's instrument. This is what's so powerful about Our Lady. Everything about her was humble. She was, she got out of God's way. Be it done unto me according to thy word. I mean, what an act of humility. Not God, I'll enter into a contract with you, right? <laughs> That's what we would do. <laughs> we said, let me see the fine print, right? Negotiations of contracts. Mary had no negotiation with the contract. Right? She, she didn't say to God that I'll, I'll, according to as I understood it, right? Otherwise you're going to transgress your bounds of justice with me or whatever. She gave God literally a blank check. She let God do with her everything that he wanted to do with her. And he did great things with her. Namely, his son was born of her. And then not only born of her, but protected by her, fed by her, taught by her, led by her, and then given to the world on the cross for its salvation. As she stood at the foot of the cross, one with him in heart. And then, of course, mothering over the church. I mean, God uses the humble in ways that confound the strong and the proud. And our world today in worldly logic is to build up our pride and build up our competency and build up our resume. And all those things are important for the world. And if you're in them, of course, you've got to do those things. But not in your soul. Your soul needs to belong to Christ and to God. And the, the, the guardian that keeps a soul in God is humility. Humility means it's not about me. It's all about you. If we're going to talk about Mary being a queen, it's because of her humility that she was able to be crowned as a queen of heaven and earth. Because being a queen just means being the instrument of the king in the most you know profound way possible. Being intimately associated with him in his reign and his design and executing that well on his behalf. And, and with her, you know, intervention and with her motherly love, 
and with her intelligence and with her prerogatives and everything that made up her. But when you're humble, you see, the, the you doesn't get in the way of the Jesus. Jesus shines through the humble person. And so the becoming humble is not an option for a Christian leader. It's the beginning of our Christian leadership. All right, so what does it mean to become humble? To become humble means that you allow the love that you have for your God to take the lead in all of your decision-making and everything that you do and all of your choices. So that I'm in love with God, that God has seized my heart. I mean, it goes back to what Jesus tells us. The greatest commandment is you will love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your strength. I feel like a lot of us today, we want a Christianity without that love. But as we all know, a Christianity without love is empty. It's vain. And in the end, it doesn't even sell, right? Like nobody really wants to belong to a church that doesn't have love, right? It doesn't have love for God in it. It's like, what's the point of a relationship with God if it's not in love? Well, this is a great opportunity for all of us to go back to, our, to ourselves and our souls and ask our hearts, do I love God? Do I let God love me? Do I have a relationship with the living God? A person who has a relationship with the living God becomes humble. Because when you have a relationship with the living God, just think about it. He's infinitely greater than me. And if he's infinitely greater than me and I belong to him and he has chosen me to be his friend and the one that he loves, well, then if I, if I blessed with that type of relationship, I mean, the world no longer defines me. He defines me. Ah, that's humility. Right? Suddenly I get out of the way because I'm allowing myself to be driven, drawn, picked up by a mystery that's infinitely greater than anything that I could control. And so what happens? It controls me. Not, not in a way that takes away my freedom, but in a way that uses my freedom for a greater end, for his end, for his glory. This is why Our Lady can be queen and we shouldn't blink at it one minute. You know, but saying that Mary is the queen of heaven and earth and therefore she's the model for leadership. You know, this is a normal thing because if you're going to say Mary shouldn't be queen, somehow that eclipses Christ the king. You're also going to say that you shouldn't lead, that you shouldn't do anything, that God can't use you for his glory. Well, that's obviously antithetical to the Christian message. Christ sent us precisely to use us. Ah, well, then he sent Mary precisely to use her. And since she allowed him to use her the most deeply and the most intimately for the most important of things, why wouldn't she be the queen of all the disciples? The queen of everyone whom God uses for his glory. Well, I think she is, which is why we can look to her and ask God to use us in the same way. And she smiles down at us and she says, my friends, to be used by God, to be his instruments, to be to, the, the things that he uses for his salvation, you got to be humble. Would you like to start your Thursday mornings with a scriptural leadership lesson? Join the St. John Leadership Network, where Father Nathan hosts a 30-minute call at 6.30 a.m. in all four U.S. time zones. To learn more, go to www. St. John Leadership Network.org slash member and join for free today. Looking at the life of the Virgin Mary, I'm reminded a lot about St. Paul. Now, obviously, the two go hand in hand because both St. Paul and the Virgin Mary were instruments of God for the salvation of the world. Right now, you could say the same thing about St. Peter and St. Joseph and about all the saints, and hopefully about you and me and about every Christian that this is what we do. If you remember when St. Paul was converted, of course, he was on his way to Syria to persecute the Christians. And then, of course, our Lord spoke to him. He falls to the ground and he, he can't see. And so he goes and for three days and for three nights, he eats nothing, drinks nothing, and is laying in a bed in Damascus. When our Lord speaks to Ananias and sends Ananias to go and see St. Paul and baptize him and tell him, give him God's word. And when Ananias says, well, this man, Paul, was the one who was persecuting Christians, Lord, the Lord responds to him, he is my chosen instrument. Now, the Greek word for instrument there is skeuos. When you look at that word closely, it doesn't mean anything specific. It literally is a vessel, any kind of thing that will carry something else. It's a great word because in its lack of specificity, it speaks to the great things that God can do at his choice with whomever he chooses. 
It's not about the merit of the person. It's about the grace that God gives to that person. And then, of course, the merit is that they correspond to that grace and that then they act that grace through in their life by their freedom. But the choice of God, uh, that's sovereign. And so being chosen sovereignly by a free choice of God, you know, to be his instrument, that ought to make us very humble. But you know, something that I've noticed about humble people is that the humbler they are, the more daring they are. (laughs) It seems like a contradiction between the two, but it's not. That's what's so marvelous about the way that God works in the soul. A humble soul offers and proffers all of the greatness, the great treasures that are within it at the service of the one that they love. If you're really humble, you're summoned through your humility to, to, to be as great as you can be in the service of the one before whom you are humble. Just go back, you know, if you're running a business, think about your employees. Think about the best employees that you have, the ones that serve you the best. Well, they're going to have two qualities to them. Number one, they're going to want to effectively follow you, right? In in a way that's helpful, in a way that's going to help you achieve the mission. And that might mean even standing up to you or saying things that are differently. But you know that they're on the same path as you. And then the second thing is that they're good at what they do. They deploy all of their, their talents at the service of what you need them to do. If you were to have someone to say, oh, I'm such a good follower, I'm so humble, therefore I don't do anything for my boss, well, you're not going to be really helping your boss. Great followers help their leaders, and they help their leaders help by their greatness, by giving the best that they have. Well, then you go back to the Virgin Mary. We just said earlier that she was the humblest of them all, and that means also that she gave the greatness of her soul at the service of God. The Latins had a word for this. It's called magnanimity. The Latin word magna means great things, right? So having magnanimity in your soul means that you're pointed towards great things, that you're trying to expand, to have a greater scope, to do things deeper, to go for the best in the service of the highest. And you see with this, why we say Mary being a queen is so important actually for us because it means that we Christians Don't just serve God in servile ways as if the greatness that he gave us is in vain or the talents that he gave us are in vain or that our intellect and our will don't matter. On the contrary, everything that God gives us, he wants us to give back. He wants us to give back how? By serving our neighbors with our gifts. So immediately, that might sound simple, But if you really take it into your heart, it becomes an ethos that can sanctify you. I am here studying, working, developing myself in order to be a better father, better spouse, better grandparent, a better leader. Now, obviously, there's seasons in our lives and there's times where our leadership changes. But really to see, I think a lot of us are wounded deep down because we don't see ourselves like God sees us. And some of us are not even willing to let, our, let, let ourselves be seen by God like he sees us. Because we know that if we were to love ourselves the way that God loves us, well, we would become a gift to everyone around us. And many of us feel wounded by our past, by our relationships, by the way people have responded to us. And it kind of clams us up. It, it, it keeps us from giving that gift. And I can understand that. There's a lot of empathy, you know, here for that. But at the same time, we've got to get over that because Mary wasn't just the handmaid of the Lord. She became his queen by his choice, obviously. And yet being a queen, it means that you give the very best that you have. There's a place of preeminence that's reserved for a queen saying that we ask you now in your preeminence to serve us by giving us everything that made you great. So in a, in a very real way, if you look at the life of the Virgin Mary, she's never turned off, right? Like from the moment God calls her, she is a gift and she continues to give, we hold in the you know, Catholic church all the way to today. I mean, she's up in heaven interceding for us, intervening for us like she did for the servants at Cana. And this is what we believe. And, and it's a marvelous and wonderful thought. 
that just as Jesus died for the salvation of souls because he loved us, so Mary stood at the foot of the cross for the salvation of souls because she loved us with Jesus, under Jesus, in Jesus, but that she loved us too. And you can say the same about all the saints. And then you can say the same about you and me. The great thing about our religion is that it's a religion of love, of passion, of drive, of men and women who not only humbled themselves before God, but because they humbled themselves before God, allowed God to use them to accomplish great things. Our problem today is not that the forces on the outside are too big or that the culture is too strong. God is bigger than everything. And God's will to save the world is bigger than everything. The real problem is that inside of our hearts, we, we aren't humble enough to let him push us, move us, prompt us, and use us for the great things of his glory. And this is where looking at Our Lady as queen can really help us. Because here we're looking at the story of someone whom God chose, God blessed, God used, and God gave for his glory. And she said yes at every step of the way. And, I mean, and there's many reasons she could have backed down. There's many reasons she could have thought this or that. But she didn't. And I can't help but be excited by the thought of what our lives would look like if we don't either, right? Like <laughs> if we allow God to use us like Mary did, if we let our hearts go for the great things, dare the great things, want the great things, it doesn't necessarily mean that we'll get them as we understand them, but it does mean that we'll have a love in our lives that's deeper and more powerful than anything else. That, that seems like something that's worth sacrificing everything for. Dare great things for Christ. Share your feedback with Father Nathan. Send us an email at communications at stjohninstitute.org. That's communications at stjohninstitute.org. And visit www.stjohninstitute.org and sign up for our newsletter to receive updates from Father Nathan. <laughs>